welcome to Das Criminal. Uh, this is Amr from Toronto. And this is Aaron from New York. Uh, glad to have you back for those of you who listened to the first episode. And welcome to those of you who started on this episode. This is not a seasonal arc. You don't have to listen to the first episode to get the second episode. This is not a story. So welcome. Yes, uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you do like what you hear, please subscribe and listen to our back catalog. Yeah, and we also have a Patreon. Check out our Patreon. There will be bonus episodes, there will be casual episodes, and you will get your name shouted out. So if you're an egomaniacal person who likes to hear their name, uh, please do subscribe and you will get to hear your name on this very podcast. Right. And today, as you probably have gathered from the episode title... We are going to be discussing Egypt, which seems very appropriate considering that Passover is fast approaching and God has inflicted a plague upon us all. This time we're discussing um, a very uh, interesting figure in Egyptian history, uh, a man, a myth maybe, even a legend you might say, uh, Anwar Sadat, um, and how he basically got owned by the people he let out, he, he himself let out of prison uh, just a decade before they decided to assassinate him. No, not the exact same people, of course, but, you know, uh, sometimes you, you're friends with Islamists, sometimes they kill you. Uh, Anwar Sarat's actually probably one of the most opportunistic worms to crawl out of the chaos of a revolution. Like, it's incredible how opportunistic this person is. Right, and as we go on, it just shows up again and again how he's really a use em and lose em type. We'll talk about this, but... Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, so without further ado, um, let's introduce the, the man, the hero of the, the intrepid hero of this story. Well, I use the word hero loosely here. Um, Anwar Sadat was born on December 25th, 1918, in the town of Munafiya um, in Egypt to a very quite a poor family, really. Um, Antichrist, what- Antichrist. <laughs> yeah, born on Christmas, much like my mom, actually. Um, also, my mom did have an alliance with Islamists, so the similarities don't just end there. Uh, I was supposed to be born on, I think, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but I was really late. I wasn't born until January. Oh, you're a late baby, hey? Yeah, my poor mother. It was awful. And my parents were so mad they didn't get a tax break for the year for having an extra dependent. <laughs> Oh, that sucks, having having to push back your tax break of another finance fiscal year. I was late to the very first. I was late to my own birth. I'm the other way around. Uh, I was born a month and a half early, which kind of describes my life. I'm always the first person in a meeting or a gathering or whatever. I was born early and my entire life has been being very early because of some, some weird anxiety about being late. If it makes either of us feel better... Uh, Jesus of Nazareth was not born in Bethlehem on December 25th. That day just relates to pagan winter solstice festivals, like that time period. So that's why we have it. And he also doesn't look like a Swedish supermodel like you see in all of those paintings. He was born in the Middle East, people. He does not look like that. He looks like Anwar Sadat. <laughs> <laughs> And what a Sadat is the pinnacle of uh, masculinity, of beauty, of... Uh, I'm, I'm doing an irony here, guys. Um, anyways, speaking of irony, actually, funny story. Uh, fast forwarding to 1973, when Anwar Sadat uh, did war uh, with Israel, one of his brothers, Atif, died as an Air Force pilot in that war. So it's kind of interesting uh, that his his brother was an Air Force pilot and he died in a war that Sadat basically conducted. To start this, uh, Sadat uh, was born in Munafiya to a poor family, uh, joined the Royal Military Academy at a time when Egypt was under sort of the King Farouk. Um, and it was a very, it was a monarchy, but it was very uh, much run by the British at the time. The, the monarchy was very much... Uh, pawn of the British. Uh, He was stationed in modern-day Sudan, uh, which at the time was jointly governed by Egypt and Britain, where he met Gamal Abdel Nasser. During World War II, he was imprisoned by the Brits for allegedly acting as a middleman between King Farouk and the Axis powers 
um, and sort of seeking the possibility of an alliance between King Farouk and the Nazis. Uh, now, it's important to understand that Sadat being born in this sort of uh, time period, his it seems that his driving motive at this point was getting the Brits out of Egypt. And King Farouk also shared that goal. Uh, we, I just said earlier that King Farouk, uh, they're not, it's not, he's not so much a pawn of the British as he's being forced to do the Brits well. And he was trying to get away from the British, but also run Egypt himself. Uh, so to reflect how opportunistic Sadat was, uh, and this is, this is incredible, this is genuinely incredible. After World War II, he was involved at some point or another with the Royalist Iron Guard of Egypt, which is basically, if anyone has read the popular sci-fi novel Dune, um, they're basically King Farouk Sardaukar. They're like his uh, elite sort of secret police assassins. They do his dirty work. They're his house painters. Uh, He was also involved in the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, He was involved with the fascist Young Egypt, also known as the Green Shirts. Uh, They're modeled uh, similar to Benito Mussolini's brown shirts. And he was involved, later on, he'd be involved with the free officers. So within a 10-year period, he basically jumped around any group or organization that basically, A, had at least two members, B, hated the British, and C, offered the potential for him to climb up the social ladder. It's uh, impressive, really. And the fact that these groups don't share very many values between them shows how he himself wasn't a principled revolutionary in any way. Yeah, he had no ideology. His only ideology was himself. He they were Actually, impressive that the only group he never really joined or was involved with was the communists um, in Egypt, which tells you a lot about the ideological purity of communists, really. Uh, he was invited into the free officers by Nasser uh, because of his connections with the Muslim Brotherhood, see above. Uh, Nasser, Nasser is actually quite smart and pragmatic in this way. When Nasser first formed the free officers, he was picking various officers that he felt A, he could trust, and B, had connections to various groups that were opposing the British at the time. So Sadat was basically Nasser's uh, in with the Muslim Brotherhood. You had uh, Khalid Muhyiddin, who was the, who was, had connections with the communists. And then you had people like Abdul Hakim Amr and Saleh Salim, who had military experience in the Palestine War and had connections to other military groups uh, that may have been sympathetic to Nasser's cause. In a lot of circumstances, I think we would agree that analyzing intimate personal relationships to pathologize a political figure like Sadat is kind of trivial and maybe beyond the point. But in this case, I think his personal relationships really speak to how much of a how much of a social climber he was and how his entire life revolved around overcoming his prescribed status and ascending to positions of power and respect. And uh, back in his hometown, Young Anwar made a friend in a neighbor girl named Ekbal Mahdi, and the Sadat family was very poor. They had dark skin, which still, you know, carries, there's still racism and colorism. Due to a combination of these factors, the Sadats being poor, being darker skinned, it doesn't sound like most people in this small town were much better off, but Ekbal's parents tried to keep her away from Anwar, and At least once as a young man, Anwar Sadat asked Ekbal's parents for permission to marry her. And they were like, no scrubs, no way. Uh, They didn't want her to marry someone from a poor family. And they didn't consider his social status acceptable. But um, (laughs) actually, if you've heard the song, the 2002 classic uh, Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne, it's basically like that. But instead of being a skater boy, he's just poor and he's kind of a jerk. But yeah, as we will see, he ends up, he graduates from the military academy. And again, he asks Ekbal's parents for permission to marry their daughter. And now he has a diploma, he has a new military job, and this carries significant prestige. So Ekbal's family finally considered him a worthy partner, and they married, and they went on to have children. And I would like to say that the story ends here, but of course it doesn't. So over the next 10 years, uh, including while Anwar was in prison for like, collaborating with the Nazis, or at least trying to. Iqbal stood by him. She was faithful, loyal. But in 1948, when Anwar Sadat was 30 years old, he attended the 15th birthday party of a young girl named Jahan Safwat Rauf. 
And she came from an upper middle class family. Her father was an Egyptian surgeon. Her mother was an English music teacher. And the British nationality carried a considerable amount of social capital in British occupied Egypt, of course. I just, I was, I'm just curious as to how he found himself in a fifth, like the birthday party of a 15 year old girl. I know he probably got invited by someone there who knows him or something, but I'd like to believe that he just sort of wanders around Cairo and shuffles into random birthday parties, trying to meet people and climb up a social ladder, which sounds a lot more like him than being invited in. Oh, right. I think he heard that this young girl of considerable social status was having a party and he thinks, I'm going to go, I'm going to cozy up to her. And that's basically exactly what he did. They soon, Anwar and Jahan, fell in love, allegedly, and Anwar divorced his first wife, Ekbal, to marry his child bride. And according to Sadat, he realized that he had fallen out of love with Ekbal when he was in prison. But he like really doesn't mention her or their marriage in his autobiographies, despite spending 10 years together. That's a significant amount of time. And even disregarding the details of, you know, whether they had an affair or whether he had already left Iqbal before he met Jahan. It's confirmed that nine months after meeting Jahan, she and Sadat were married when she was still only 15 years old and he was 31. Like a gag. I mean, it's... It's surreal, just strange. I I don't understand why uh, Jahan's parents were okay with this. Like, I I don't. They were. I don't see how. Yeah. They were. No, they didn't like. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I I I suppose he had the connections to sort of marry her regardless of her parents' approval. Well, it could even be a situation where Jahan was really set on doing this, and her parents realized, you know, if we cut her off, then we lose our daughter. Whereas if we just begrudgingly accept this, we could at least still have a relationship with her. I I don't know all their family details, but what we do learn from this is that Anwar Sadat was probably a shitty husband to his first wife and definitely a creep to his second. But I think more importantly, it shows us how much of a status seeker he was. And as a poor child back in the village, Iqbal symbolized a higher social standing that he eventually sought to achieve. And when he graduated from the military academy, he was able to seize her as a token of his aspirations, as a symbol of the status that he wanted. But then as he gained connections through the military and worked his way in with the free officers, he outgrew Iqbal's utility as a social symbol. So when he met Jahan, someone of an even higher economic class, though she was only half his age, he was pretty keen to drop Iqbal and attach himself to Jahan. Yeah, you, you mentioned you mentioned him saying that he fell in love with uh, Jahan, but it's kind of, I, I, I know we were talking about this earlier, but it's kind of interesting because I don't think he can love people. I think he strikes me as a kind of person who loves people only in what they bring to him, not as independent beings. It's kind of really sad and angering in a way. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, really indicative of someone who lacks social integrity. Like I've even gone on dates where the other person has treated me to a nice dinner or cocktails or something like that. And then after I've thought about it and thought, I actually didn't enjoy talking with this person that much. I enjoyed the cocktail that I was drinking and I would be a dishonest person to say, oh yeah, let's go on another date so you can buy me more cocktails and I can continue not to be very interested by you, you know? But I think he is the type of person who would be like, oh, I'm going to go out with this person again because they have what I want. Yeah, he strikes me as like a couple of people I knew from university who would like serially date, not for any particular reason besides getting like free dinners and drinks and so on and so forth. But with him, it's almost, it goes a lot deeper than that. He married, he married Jahan when she was 15 years old. And he, throughout his whole life, personally and politically, he was perceived by the public as a compliant ass kisser who followed Nasser around like a hungry dog. But his loyalty came not from any revolutionary principles or any commitment to Nasser's policies. He just wanted to maintain proximity to Nasser because he was Egypt's, you know, most forceful leader. And I think During this time, if any other figure had been able to mount a significant opposition campaign against Nasser with a considerable likelihood of deposing him and creating a new government, Sadat would have dropped Nasser right away, just like he dropped Iqbal and declared his allegiance to to someone else. And I think he's like that friend that you had in high school who 
if the popular kids asked them to hang out, they would just turn their back on you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He definitely had that energy. Um, he's 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 he would have been a snitch. He would have been a snitch in school just to get in with the teachers as well. He would have been that kid who joins every extracurricular club and student government and sports teams and things like that to pad his college resume, but he doesn't actually have a passion for any of these things. He's Egyptian Pete Buttigieg. He's basically Egyptian Pete Buttigieg. I don't know which is more insulting to him or to Pete Buttigieg, but uh, there you are. Speaking of wives, on the night of the coup uh, in 1952, when the free officers end up overthrowing the monarchy, Sadat went to a theater with his wife and got into a fight with another theater attendee, a noisy fight. And then he ended up going to the police station to file a report, not because he forgot the day or because he wasn't told of the coup, but because he was specifically because he was hedging his bets. He knew the coup was going to happen, and his excuse to the coup plotters was that he was being too watched to do anything. He was being monitored by uh, the police and so on. There was there, there's, there's been uh, in, investigations into a possible coup, but it, realistically, he was just there just in case the coup fails and he's like yeah what coup i was in the theater with my wife you know just my second wife my 15 year old wife and yeah it's just the just kind of person who would do that kind of thing he writes in his memoirs um after the coup succeeds um it was obvious that we hadn't prepared ourselves when we carried out our revolution for taking over government posts we had no ambition to be government ministers We had not envisaged that and not even drawn up a specific government program. Like, just the way he says things is very calculated, but also just, I don't know, he just strikes, I get get the heebie-jeebies every time I think of him as, as a political leader and as a person. He wants to be a leader so badly, but he also has, he's such a follower. He's not very good at forging his own path. He's a coattail rider. Yes. Yes, absolutely. He has he has no ideology. He has no charisma. He has nothing going for him. He's just, and which is, by the way, why Nasser picked him as vice president because he was willing to be a doormat. I think it was one of biggest, Nasser's biggest mistakes picking him as VP. But there you are. Um, after the coup, of course, uh, the free officers asked Ali Maher to form a government. Um, he resigns the same year because the free officers implement a land reform policy that Maher opposed because he was part of the landed aristocracy. Um, he was succeeded by General Najib, who was the senior most of the free officers. Even though Nasser was the sort of like leader in action, Najib was given the presidency because he was the general. You know, he was the, the highest ranking officer of the lot. Um, unfortunately, um, with Najib as president after Nasser abolishes the monarchy in 1953, uh, there ends up a rivalry between Najib's government and what Nasser calls the Revolutionary Command Council, a sort of organ that Nasser creates after the revolution that exists above the civilian government. Um, And it creates a sort of situation that's like basically dual power with two competing organs of government. And then in the same year, uh, actually, you know, the next year, 1954, the, the Muslim Brotherhood attempt to assassinate Nasser and then... He, they fail, but he manages to use that failed assassination to get rid of his political enemies, including Najib. Uh, so he was never convicted, but in the trials, his name was dropped enough to force a resignation and have him kept on house arrest for the rest of his life. So Nasser becomes president, and one of the first things he does is appoint Anwar Sadat as minister for state. Our boy is really climbing up here. He's really going up the ladder. Um, so he becomes Minister of State as well as editor for Al Jumhuriya, which is the state's daily newspaper. Uh, now, I would say Al Jumhuriya, but Egyptians somehow seem to conflate G with G for some reason. But I'll give it to them here. It's Al Jumhuriya, apparently. And then, and then Sadat moves up even more by being appointed president of the National Assembly from 1960 to 1968, and then vice president in 1968. Um, until Nasser's death in 1970. And this is just my personal theory here. There is nothing really confirming it, and there's nothing that can confirm it. But I do believe that Sadat was appointed vice president because Nasser saw him as docile and as a doormat. Because the way Nasser took power from Najib, he feared another person would dispose of him the way he got rid of Najib. So 
he put Sarat in as a guy, like a yes man, a person who would just rubber stamp whatever Nasser wanted, really. Right. The the public used to call Sadat Nasser's poodle. And, and the, he's incredible. Like, just a guy who has no spine at all. Yeah, Kelb Nasser. Um, yeah, so he becomes president in 1970 when um, Nasser dies on September 28th. Um, interestingly, Nasser dies a few days after mediating between Yasser Arafat and uh, King Abdullah II of Jordan after Black September. Was it Abdullah or Hussein? I think Hussein. it was Hussein at the time. Hussein. It was Hussein, yeah. It was Hussein, yeah. So Nasser, the, the stress of the mediation between the PLO and uh, the Jordanian monarchy basically got to him and he suffered a massive heart attack and died, uh, which allows Sadat to climb climb up the social ladder to the pinnacle of Egyptian politics. Um, and the first thing he does, um, which is incredible, is expel 21,000 Soviet military advisors but still reaffirm the pact of friendship between Egypt and the Soviet Union. Again, hedging his bets, staying on the fence, uh, trying to see which of the Soviet Union or the U.S. would be more um, open to his alliances. But what is interesting is that by by expelling uh, those uh, advisors, he incentivized the Soviet Union to supply Egypt with high-tech weaponry because they were afraid he would shift to the American camp. So he was basically guilt-tripping them. Um, in a weird sort of political way. Um, He shuffles the military cabinet to remove opposition. He conducts a secret pact with Syria in January of 1973 um, to outline a unified military command. All this, by the way, in preparation of a war with Israel in which his his sole objective is to regain control of the Sinai Peninsula and the Suez Canal. Um, He also visits Saudiya, and talks to King Faisal about using oil as a weapon against the, the Israel and its allies by, you know, sort of conducting an embargo, uh, first of all, by ramping up prices and then conducting an embargo against anyone who would support Israel. So he's preparing his chessboard. He's trying to get all the pieces in order. Saturday, October 6th of 1973, uh, is the, the day he makes his move, the Yom Kippur War. The troops, the Egyptian troops, break the bar lev line very easily, while Syria at the same time is coordinated to punch deep into the occupied uh, Golan Heights. At this point, Syria and Egypt are coordinating very well. Um, Syria drives deep into Golan, Egypt drives deep into the Sinai. The IDF planes have no chance against the Soviet SAM-6 missiles that the USSR supplied him. Uh, the anti-tank rockets are wrecking havoc on Israeli armored columns, uh, and the Egyptian armies succeeds like they surprise everyone by succeeding on all their missions and all their objectives early on october 16th uh about a week and a half after the israelis launch a counterattack that pushes syria re- back um across the Golan while also encircling the egyptian army on the east side of this uh of the suez canal um on the same day OPEC meets, or or what would later become OPEC meets, and uh, they they agree to uh, impose a price hike of five percent per month as long as uh, Israel keeps uh, committing aggression. Eventually, uh, an embargo on any country that supports Israel, which ends up being the United States and the Netherlands, um, a complete oil embargo. Um, and an interesting situation happens when uh, the Algerian foreign minister goes to uh, Kissinger during uh, meetings between the oil uh, producing countries and the US to try and resolve the conflict. He asks Kissinger why US uh, Security Council Resolution 242, which recognizes that the Sinai belongs to Egypt, why was it not imposed prior to the embargo? And Kissinger said that, and I, I'm going to try to make Kissinger's voice here, but you know, you could you could uh, criticize this impression. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the reason you uh, the, was the complete military superiority of Israel, the weak do not negotiate. The Arabs has been weak. Now they are strong. The Arabs have achieved more than anyone, including themselves, thought possible. How, how was that good? Was yeah, I liked it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my Kissinger impressions just in case he dies and there needs to be a new Kissinger. Kind of like the poop, really, but for vile war crime. Why would the world ever want another Kissinger? <laughs> I don't know, man. You ask the US, you ask the UK, you ask all the imperialist nations. They will tell you that they will need another Kissinger. 
Anyways, uh, the war continues. Le- Le- uh, Brezhnev of the Soviet Union calls Nixon. They ask for joint diplomatic efforts to end the war. Um, and Brezhnev sort of implies that if if the joint diplomatic efforts aren't started, the, the Soviet Union will be forced to intervene to project, protect Egypt, uh, which was its ally at the time. Um, and the Red Army and Soviet Navy are put on alert, which sort of causes the U.S. military to put its uh, military on high nuclear alert for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, October 22nd, a ceasefire is proclaimed and UN Security Council Resolution 338 reaffirms 242 by uh, stating that the Sinai belongs to Egypt, the Suez Canal belongs to Egypt, and that Israel should withdraw to its pre-67 borders. On December 21, 1973, the UN conference, uh, which was boycotted, by the way, by half of al-Assad, um, and the PLO were not allowed to attend. They were vetoed by both Israel and Jordan, who I guess still held the grudge after Black September. It starts to uh, plan for a peace. Sadat attends. Uh, there's still no conclusive peace. But on January 18th, 1974, Egypt and Israel conclude a truce. This sort of begins Egypt's what we call normalization with the Zionist entity, Tatbi in Arabic. This this is a marked shift from uh, Nasser's attitude towards Israel and going back to discussing Sadat as a sort of opportunist without ideology. It It's clear that when he was in the free officers, he really, never really believed in the revolutionary spirit or ideological principle. And when he became Nasser's VP, he had no interest in sort of upholding Nasserism as a political uh, project. Uh, and you can see that because as soon as he got he got power, he decided to normalize relations with, with Israel, which something Nasser would have never done. And this culminates in November 20th, 1977, when Sadat makes a historic visit to Israel and gives a speech at the Knesset. Knesset, yeah, okay, the Knesset. Allow me to address my call from this rostrum to the people of Israel. I convey to you the message of security, safety, and peace to every man, woman, and child in Israel. And then, you know, he goes on for a bit, and then he says, Let us be frank with each other. How can we achieve permanent peace based on justice? Uh, He goes on, and then he says, Nobody in the world would accept today's slogans propagated here in Israel. Ignoring the existence of a Palestinian people and questioning even their whereabouts, As we really and truly seek peace, we really and truly welcome you to live among us in peace and security, which is disgusting because it's rich coming from a man standing on colonized land, on stolen land, opening diplomatic relations with a settler colonial entity, um, talking about peace as if uh, they're all on equal terms here. Um, one of the pictures I sent Aaron and I'm going to link here is a picture of Hafez al Assad sat on a bench after a session of the Syrian parliament in which he's basically about to have an aneurysm because he, was never, he wasn't told that Sadat was going to visit Israel and he hears about it and he's just he's going to throw a vein because at this point the Golan will not return to Sur- uh, Syria. Um, and it's, it's really, really like depressing uh, that Egypt, which was considered the, the, the center of resistance to Israel um, prior to Sadat, sort of just this happens, basically. And then a year later, September 17th, 1978, uh, Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat signed the Camp David Accords. Sadat gets the Sinai back at the cost of conceding Palestinian right to self-determination. So the Sinai is returned to, to Egypt, but um, the, the Camp David Accords have no mention of Palestinian right to self-determination, no answer to the refugee question with regards to all the Palestinian diaspora that left after the Nakba. Basically nothing to answer Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian cause. Um, and the, the Arab League are, you know, completely uh, uh, apoplectic. They expel uh, Egypt. And while while Egypt is committing full diplomatic ties with Israel, including opening an embassy in Cairo in 1980, the Egypt is completely expelled from the Arab League. So its flag goes down from the Arab League building, just as the Israeli flag is raised in Cairo as uh, the embassy is opened. I think this is a really perfect example of Sadat's use them and lose them mindset that we talked about earlier, because one of the only reasons the Egyptian army was able to have that military success against the Israeli army was because of Hafez al-Assad's coordinated attempt to reclaim the Jalan Heights, because this forced Israel to fight uh, on two different fronts. 
And once Sadat had the leverage that he wanted, in part due to the Syrian military, he just totally threw Syria and Palestine under the bus because they were no longer politically or militarily useful to him. And most of the Egyptian public saw right through this and they didn't want a continuation of war or fighting, but they were really unhappy with Sadat selling out their allies and isolating them from the rest of the Arab world. And a lot of Egyptians felt like these policies were being shoved down their throats against their will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's just interesting that Sadat, so Sadat, when Sadat entered the war in 1973, his only military objective and political objective was to regain control of the Sinai and the Suez. He never had any interest in Syria getting back the Golan or Palestinian liberation or Palestinian rights. Uh, for him, the only objective, the only concern was the Suez Canal and getting control of that. Once he got that, he was more than happy to not only throw Palestinians and Syrians under the bus, but then reverse the bus, run them over again, and then drive uh, over them one more time just to make sure they're down. It's the most despicable example of, I got mine, you get yours. Basically, yeah. Um, his, his domestic policies were not any better either. Uh, he, as soon as he entered, he he uh, announced what he called the corrective revolution, which was basically a reaction to Nasserism um, and a purge of Nasserists from government um, and a complete reversal of Nasser's economic policies. Uh, so he first of all, he releases Islamists from prison. So Nasser threw a bunch of Muslim Brotherhood members and other Islamist groups into prison when he got in power and... Sadat's first act was to release them. For, like Explicitly, he says that he's releasing them as part of a political sort of like uh, an Egyptian glasnost where, you know, you can have like political opinions and opposition and so on. But the pragmatic and cold and calculated reason is to use Islamists as a counterweight to the Nasserists and leftists in government and society and sort of position himself as this balancing power that... You know, if the Nasserists and leftists get too too uppity, he can look at the he can point at the Islamists and say, "I'm the only one protecting you from these people." Right. It's it's really a classic authoritarian strategy to embolden people who you know are bad news and use that as an excuse to crack down on everyone. Basically, yeah, it was it was from a strategic perspective, it was cunning and it was smart, but from a sort of principled perspective, it was repulsive. On the economic front. Uh, he imp- uh, implemented what he called infitah, which is a reversal of Nasser's command economy model by reducing the public sector and opening Egypt to private investment. Uh, it was part of Sadat's broader ideological shift from the Soviet Union to the American uh, camp and to capitalism as a broad project, but not out of some sort of ideological loyalty or belief, but just because he saw where the winds were blowing and decided to hedge himself with the winning bet, if you will. This infitah policy is a disaster. It's one of the biggest disasters to Egypt. Um, It's about as disastrous to Egypt as Perestroika and Glasnost were to Russia. And the sorry state that the Egyptian public sector is in today is a direct result of that. Um, in January 1977, there were bread riots because Sadat tried to remove the subsidies on bread and other essentials. Uh, he retracted the, the, his policies and reinstates the subsidies after two days of rioting and various towns set on fire. So July 21st, 1977, Sadat invades Libya in a maneuver that I think it's not well known. It's quite, uh, I, I only re- uh, learned about it by reading Eugene Rogan's The Arabs of History. Um, and it's basically, um, I feel like every leader in uh, different parts of history, they have to have one botched foreign policy, like one disaster. And this was his disaster, the same way Yemen was uh, Nasser's disaster. And so he invades Libya because basically he needs money. Um, Egypt is doesn't have a lot of oil. Libya has a lot of oil. And he looks over across the border to Gaddafi's oil fields and he says, mm, maybe I should have those. I, I, want, I, I like those. those. Those smell good. Those look good. I'll take those. Uh, so he initiates a couple of border skirmishes, um, which the Libyan border guards sort of respond to. Uh, there were a couple of uh, confrontations uh, that he then uses an ex- as an excuse to shell uh, border towns for nine days 
while also advancing armored columns across the desert into Libya. Um, he takes a couple of uh, insignificant border towns before the pressure from the United States basically forces him to withdraw. He achieves absolutely nothing. It's a complete disaster, and it's just an embarrassment to his uh, administration. Now, one of the interesting things about Sadat is his relationship to the Shah of Iran, and it's something that's going to come into play later on. In 1971, he visited Iran and addressed parliament in fluent Farsi, calling Reza Shah his brother. Um, he built strong economic times, economic ties with the Shah, uh, such that to the point when Reza Shah was exiled, he spent his last months in Egypt because no other country would have him uh, for fear of upsetting the Islamic Republic. Um, when uh, Reza Shah dies in Egypt on the 27th of July 1980, Sadat orders a full state funeral, which basically makes the Iranian government at the time under Khomeini apoplectic. But there you are. This all culminates in a sort of climax, if you will, on the 6th of October, 1981. Uh, there's a military parade commemorating the October War, the Yom Kippur War's victory. Sadat is being, uh, he sat on the podium overlooking the parade. Parades are a very mid 20th century thing, you know, military parades. You know, I, I, I'm, I kind of miss them in a way. I wish we had more military parades. Kind of amusing. Anyways, he sat on the podium and a truck led by Lieutenant Khalid Islambuli, who is uh, connected to a group called Islamic Jihad, along with Junior Sergeant Abdul Hamid Abdul Salam, 31 years old, Corporal Ata Tayal Hamida Rahil, 21 years old, and Corporal Hussein Abbas, also 21 years old, uh, stop the truck and rush towards the podium. Sadat, being the idiot that he is, thinks this is part of the parade, so he stands and salutes them. Um, at which point they basically open fire at him. They throw a bunch of grenades. Uh, they kill him and a bunch of other people. That thus ends the life of the great hero known as Enwar Sadat. The theatrics of this are really astounding. Just the way it was pulled off, that the assassins boarded a military truck and blended in with the military parade is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's one, as far as assassinations go, it's one of the, on the better side of the plan planning and uh, executing, really. I don't see how it could have gone wrong short of being found out before the actual assassination. You know, like if you're in a military parade and you're part of the parade, no one is going to look at you funny if you're holding a gun or have grenades because you're part of the military parade. So, and that's the closest you can ever get to a, like a leader like Sarah. So, you know, why not? Uh, incidentally, the fatwa, the, the Islamic fatwa to assassinate Anwar al-Sadat was issued by Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, who, uh, also known as the Blind Sheikh, who died in an American prison because of uh, uh, being convicted for his role in the 1993 World Trade Center bombings. Um, so it was, it was basically a, a reaction from the Islamist elements in Egypt, the hardcore, the hardline Islamist elements, uh, what is perceived to be a reaction to Sadat's normalizing with Israel and their displeasure at that. So I guess what, what I'm trying to say is, but, or what was I saying? Don't feed, don't, don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's the one. Uh, yeah. So I guess they bit the hand that fed them and. Initially, by the way, initially, um, Khalid Islambouli was not invited to participate in the parade, but they were chosen by Colonel Abu de Zamar of military intelligence to replace a platoon that, quote unquote, failed regular checkups. Uh, incidentally, Colonel Abu de Zamar was also has connections to Islamic Jihad and other Islamist militias and paramilitaries in Egypt. The way that, like you said, the theatrics of the assassination are incredible. They toss three grenades, two of which fail to blow up, but one does. They fire AK-47s into the uh, podium, um, killing 11 and wounding 28. Um, before Khalid Islambouli, the ringleader, runs up to the podium, fires into Sadat at point-blank range and shouts... I am Khalid Islambouli. I have killed Pharaoh and I do not fear death, which as far as uh, uh, proclamations go, is pretty much uh, on the cooler end of the spectrum, along with John Wilkes Booth's Six Semper Tyrannis. So one attacker was shot dead. Um, Khalid Islambouli was tried, found guilty and executed by firing squad, along with several of his uh, co-conspirators. Incidentally, Khalid Islambouli was declared a martyr by Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran because of Sadat's uh, relationship with the Shah. Sadat was succeeded by Husni Mubarak, um, who is somehow an even worse and more craven worm than Sadat. 
a coward's coward, if you will. One of the interesting things is that Talat al-Sarat, his Sarat, Anwar al-Sarat's nephew, um, in 2005, he claimed international conspiracy that Israel, the U.S., and uh, the top echelons of uh, Egyptian military all conspired to assassinate Anwar. And he ended up spending a year in jail for defaming the army, for sort of propagating that conspiracy theory on television interviews and so on. Um, incidentally, a relative or a journalist, I will have to check, but someone accused Sadat actually of poisoning Nasser with slow acting poison, which caused his death. And there was also a lawsuit uh, that was settled out of court and the details haven't been made public, but plenty of people are accusing people of assassinating others. A lot of assassination accusations flying around Egypt. I, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. I really wouldn't. Um, Sadat does strike me as the kind of person who would use poison to his benefit. Sadat's assassins hoped that this very public killing would bring about an Islamist revolution in the country akin to that in Iran, but it obviously never ended up happening. And one of the grand questions we want to interrogate on this podcast is whether individual assassinations are politically effective and this episode, plus our Patreon bonus episode on Yitzhak Rabin, puts two points pretty firmly in the no category. Killing one leader isn't going to bring about a revolution. Like if if someone assassinated the leader of one of our countries, being Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau, it wouldn't fundamentally change the structure of either country. And there are people highly affiliated with them to step into their roles. Yeah, I've always found it very discomforting when I hear about people talking about Donald Trump's impeachment. Like, do you really want Michael Pence to become president? Like, if anything, Mike Pence is even worse because Trump is an idiot and he's an imbecile and he can be easily distracted, whereas Pence has the discipline and steel to go through on whatever psychotic plans he has brewed up. Like you said, like, I don't know, it's one of the things I also have a problem with the sort of anarchist uh, pr- uh, uh, propaganda of the deed idea. Like, it's all well and cool to, like, shoot a leader in the head or whatever. But without a sort of mass movement, without a sort of political mobilization, and without power, political power... There is, like, it's just nothing. Just killed one guy. Like, like Hosni Mubarak succeeded Anwar Sadat. Where where did the Islamists go from there? Like, it's, Mubarak is not an Islamist. He never implemented any Islamist ideas. The only thing they got was Morsi for two years, and then they got overthrown again. So they're, 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 the assassination did nothing to, to further their goals. Right. It was only successful in terms of it killed Sadat. Like, it, it worked in that way, but it didn't bring about any fundamental change to Egypt. Yeah, because because the military structure around Sadat, the sort of junta that that uh, evolved to rule Egypt, was still there. And it would continue to be there. And it existed even after the Arab Spring in 2011, um, after Tahrir Square. And we saw that when the military stepped in to overthrow Mursi and replace him with Sisi. It gives some insight into how we in so-called Western democratic countries see leaders of countries outside the West. Like we project this cult of personality onto them. And that's why you get phrases like, you know, Assad must go and these other things. And we think, oh, if only they stepped down or were deposed, everything would fundamentally change. That that has never been the case. Yeah, there's this weird uh, obsession in the Western press and media and so on, and just general public at large in in creating metronyms for countries, like turning countries into single individuals. Like Russia is always Putin. Syria is always Assad, you know? Like there's no, there's no uh, consideration that a country might have differing blocks of people with differing opinions and differing perspectives and they might want different things they might seek different things it's quite insulting because it just reduces countries to just one single individual it ignores how actually uh, take the uk as an example the past several prime ministers labor and tory have been supportive of endeavors like the war in iraq so if you're iraqi Why should you really care about their differences on, you know, education policy in the UK? Who cares? They're the same. Yeah, like, it's the same with the US as well. Like, people are like, we should support Joe Biden because Democrats are better than Republicans or whatever. And Joe Biden voted for the war in Iraq. Joe Biden doesn't want to have Medicare for all. Joe Biden, like, 
you're you're gonna get the same policies as a Republican government, except maybe some minor culture war uh, victories that were completely in, insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Right, and even if Joe Biden were to step away or get sick from coronavirus or any number of things, the large constituency of the Democratic Party who wants to feel good about themselves for calling themselves progressive, but doesn't want to support any progressive change, they will just prop up someone else. It'll be Pete Buttigieg or maybe Warren or, you know, someone else from that posse. Yeah, Kamala or Cory Booker. Right. Yeah. By the way, I do genuinely have uh, a theory that Joe Biden might already be dead and they're just using uh like you know they're cutting up speeches of him that were pre-prepared prior to him dying basically because like we haven't seen him around and all the all the videos he's uploaded shows his strong cgi uh influence so i'm not sure if i'm I'm 50 50 on whether he's alive or dead oh i have this theory that prince charles has been dead for a long time and they've basically made a puppet out of its corpse and they they make the corpse puppet like drive and they take pictures of it. But when you look at it, it looks like a cadaver. He looks like... <laughs> oh, a- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think Prince Charles will only disappear once he gets to insult every country in the world at least once. Oh, if I were Prince William right now, I would be prepping for my coronation. Doomsday is upon us, you know? Um, she, Prince Harry is probably like lumbering around somewhere with Meghan Markle. Um, honestly, I, you know, I had a coworker in my office who was a Canadian, a Canadian, like born and raised from Canada, no, like, you know, uh, external ancestry, whatever. But somehow, for some weird reason, she was a British monarchist. Like a hardcore British monarchist. She had British flags on her desk. She she watches Downton Abbey and Coronation Streets religiously. She woke up at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning to watch the royal marriage between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They The royal family has a lot of fans, like very devoted fans. And I think the demographic is mostly white women, maybe 30 and older. Oh yeah, she was sixty five. Though my coworker, yeah, that fits. Um, I mean, at, at some point, we're definitely going to do probably several episodes on the Bolshevik Revolution and the killing of the Romanovs. That fits pretty neatly into our niche that we're carving out for ourselves. Oh yeah, the theme is good for that. Also, the the post. Uh, I don't want to say Stalinist purges because I don't believe Stalinism is a real term. But like the the trials of uh, Kamenev and Zinoviev and other day one Bolshevik sort of uh, thinkers who were purged during the Stalin years in the thirties. One thing you, our listeners, might have noticed is that a lot of our content revolves around the Middle East, and then the USA and Canada, and in Ireland, will do because that's where we have our roots. If you are from a place that is not these places and you know a good case for us to cover, you know, especially if you're from South America or East Asia or a place that we are really interested in but don't have the same background, please suggest it to us. Let us know. Yeah, please do. We're open to hearing about uh, cases from all over the world. Nothing, Nothing gets me going like political true crime. Right. And we want all types of places and uh, historical time periods and events and things like that to be represented. We want to make sure that cases with women are very much represented, even though women are often underrepresented in politics. Yeah, we want to hear about both women as assassins and as victims of crime, especially as assassins. Actually, I wonder, what are some famous women assassins? Well, next week, our episode will be women-focused on women revolutionaries, but there were um, there were several women who killed Nazis as snipers and some who even like lured Nazis into the woods and then shot them. Oh yeah, here I heard about them, the German the German girls who who did that. And then uh, what's her name? Lu, Vlad, Vlad, something Lud, Ludvenka, Ludvenka, something like that. I think I've heard of Dutch girls, Dutch girls who did it. Yeah, and then there was the Soviet snipers, the Soviet women snipers 
who basically racked up uh, over 100 Nazi kills. Yeah, and we've also got, um, we have women revolutionary figures like Leila Khaled, of course. Oh yeah, we should, we're going to do an episode on hijacking various planes. Yeah, we're going to have a have a lot of hijacking episodes. And again, a lot will be focused on the Middle East because that's where our various interests and backgrounds lie. Yeah. Should we tell the people, if you like this podcast, what should you do? You should subscribe, first of all. So that you never yes. miss our new episodes. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast. Our, our podcast is now up on um, almost uh, all the big apps. So subscribe on your preferred uh, vehicle for podcast listening. Uh, check out our Patreon um, if you haven't already. Um, it's Das Criminal. Um, we have various tiers. Um, if you want to join our various tiers uh so we have we have three tiers. We have our three dollar tier, which gets you a shout out on the show. Uh, so a shout out to Dermot for being our first patron. Thanks, Dermot. He's our friend. So I'm applauding. Thank you so much for five dollars. Oh, and also for three dollars, we are going to put up some polls and suggestion boxes and such. So if you have a suggestion or just want to contribute more to how we run the podcast, you will be first in line to give us your feedback. And to the friends that have already listened and given us feedback, uh, thank you. We are listening to it. We're, of course, working on our audio and making some adjustments and getting into the swing of things. But thanks for listening. Even to our first app, that's obviously not going to be perfect. Yeah, we're, we're, we're improving. We're just getting our feet uh, here. And uh, we'll, we're only climbing up from here. Much like Anwar Sadat, we're climbers. <laughs> exactly. Um, for $5, you can get our kind of just casual chat show. We talk about politics and the news. We talk about books we're reading, what we're up to. Um, It's pretty laid back. We do that once or twice a month. And then for $10, you get a full bonus episode every single month. Yeah. So for $3, you're part of the Gramsci Guild, if you're a big fan of Antonio Gramsci. Um, For $5 a month, you're part of the Saeed Syndicate. And for $10 a month, you get to join the Connolly Collective. Basically, for the, the price of a cup of coffee, you can support us. And it really means a lot to us. And even if you can't, please tell your friends just to listen to the podcast, subscribe, get those download numbers up. And, you know, the more it gets around to people, obviously, the more support we will be able to derive from it. You can follow us on social media at Das Criminal Pod. Um, we also always link to our sources in the episode description. We have a master list of all our sources that you can check out with links. So look for that. All right. Until next time. Thanks so much, guys. Stay safe. Take care. Bye.